In this very important message, we share the importance of knowing, believing, receiving and resting in the Father's love. Doing so will completely set us free. We've been spending the uh, last several weeks talking about the Father's love. Uh, this is uh, part four in the series of um, where we're exploring or examining the Father's love. Uh, we've uh, divided this over six Sundays, so we have a Two more to go after today, uh, where we will continue on the same theme about the Father's love. And uh, I just want to spend the first few minutes uh, just to recap, review uh, some of the things we have covered already. And uh, like we said earlier, we're taking our time uh, in this, no hurry. We want to examine the Father's love, just, just understand this, uh, because this, this whole topic or this whole theme uh, is so important for us. Uh, we, we made a statement in the very beginning that our revelation of God affects our relationship with God. You know, what you know about God, uh, how you perceive God affects how you relate to Him. So if our revelation or our perception of God is somebody who is mean, bad, angry, uh, always waiting to knock us down, then we are going to relate to him very fearfully, very, you know, afraid, scared of him. Uh, and uh, he's, you know, some great big somebody out there that you shouldn't approach too often. Uh, if that's our perception of God. But if you know him as a, a heavenly father who loves you, then your whole relationship with God is different. And uh, the Bible presents God. One of the aspects of God that the Bible presents to us is that God is our heavenly father. And as he's a loving heavenly father. And that's what we have been examining the last several days. And uh, we also said this, that our relationship with God then affects our relationship with other people. If you, if we are in a, in a great relationship with God, then how we relate to people also uh, is great. We, we uh, flow out of the love that we experience, of the relationship we have with God. We flow out of that in our relationship with people. We try to emulate God. We try to follow His example in our relationships with people. So our relationship with God also affects our relationship with people. We'll, we'll see more about that next Sunday. Uh, the, some of the things that we've covered in the series, so our objective in the series is really to understand the Father's love and to come to that place where we receive, we experience, and we are resting in the love that the Father has for us. So in part one, we talked about infinite God, our heavenly Father, that this great God who created this universe also desires or seeks to be our Father. He seeks to be your your heavenly Father. And He wants that kind of a relationship. He desires that kind of relationship with you and me. Uh, in part two, we talked about God's immeasurable love. Uh, there is no measure of the vast expanse of God's love. And yet the Bible tells us that we need to be deeply rooted and securely grounded in this love. So that you understand the love of God and, and, and it doesn't shift or change with what happens around you. You're so established in the fact that God loves you. And nothing changes, if, even though your circumstance around you change and all of that. So we need to be established in God's immeasurable love for us. Last Sunday we talked about our Heavenly Father's true picture. We were contrasting God is father with earthly parents, just to highlight uh, uh, the, the aspect of God's nature, who he is. He is an unchangeable heavenly father. He's an unfailing heavenly father. He's a father who is bountiful, who is generous. He's a merciful father, a redeeming father, an accepting father. Uh, he's a father of abundant grace. He's an empowering father, and he's an infinite father. Amen? So that's uh, just few uh, aspects of God as Father. This morning, as we continue this series on the Father's love, our focus is on receiving the Father's love. That means this morning we want each of us to come into a place where we personally experience the Father's love for us, to receive the Father's love. So I want to spend the, the first part of this message uh, just reminding us of some aspects of the Father's love 
and then we go into talking about uh, the importance of receiving that love, personally receiving that love, and what it will do for you and me. So let's begin with First Corinthians chapter thirteen, verses four through eight. Now, First Corinthians thirteen, verses four through eight. Uh, these verses are really talking about human relationship. Paul is saying you got to love each other like this. We understand that. But in doing that, he's talking about the love of God. He's saying, this is the God kind of love, and you and I must walk in this love towards each other. Walk in the God kind of love. So it is safe to take these verses and say, if God wants me to walk in this kind of love towards each other, uh, towards one another, God's love, then surely that's the way he would love me, or that's the way he would love us. Right? So let's read 1 Corinthians 13 verses 4 through 8 and look at it from the perspective of this is the God kind of love. Therefore God himself loves me like this. So let's read that. Verse 4. Love, that's the God kind of love. Love suffers long. That is it's patient and is kind. Love does not envy. It's not jealous. The God kind of love. It's not jealous. Love is not, does not parade itself. It's not proud. It's not puffed up. Is not arrogant. Love does not behave rudely. It's not rude. Love does not seek its own. It's not selfish or self-seeking or self-serving. It's not provoked. It's not irritable. It's not easily angered. It thinks no evil. It has no evil intent, no malicious plans. Uh, verse 6, does not rejoice in iniquity. Uh, it doesn't you know, take pleasure in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It, 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 it takes pleasure and truth when righteousness is established. Love bears all things. It, 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 it puts up with everything. It believes all things. It believes in the best for the other person. It believes in the best in the other person. Love hopes all things. It hopes for the best. It keeps the best in view. It endures all things. It stands the test of time. It stands the test of challenges. It's able to endure. And love never fails. Now just think about this whole thing in how God loves you and me. So we could say these things. God is love. So God is patient and kind towards us. So say that with me. God is patient. Very patient and kind towards me. God is not rude towards us. All right, so let me say the other things here. It's, uh, God is not selfish. I mean, he, you know, some people think, man, God is doing all this just for because he is so egocentric. It's all for him. <laughs> hey, love is not self-centered. He's not doing this just for him. He has our best interests. He is seeking our well-being. His plans for us are good. Love is not easily provoked. So God doesn't get angry at the drop of a hat. Love, God does not think evil towards us. Love thinks no evil. God does not think evil towards you. His plans for you are good. God does not rejoice in sin. God rejoices in truth when we walk in truth. God bears or puts up with all things. We can all say amen to that, you know. Yeah, he puts up with a lot with me. He puts up with love, endures. It bears all things. Right? And God believes and hopes that he's inclined and he's persuaded in the best for us. It hopes the best. So that's how when God relates to you. And he's relating to you with this, this God who's love. This God kind of love. It, it believes in the best. It's patient. It's kind. It hopes all things. That's how God relates to you and me. And God never fails. His love for us never fails. So we should be settled. This is how the Heavenly Father loves me. This is an expression, a description of His love for me. Uh, some other things that we've mentioned, which we will reiterate here, is that love, God's love for us, the Father's love for us, is love that is unconditional. That means He loves us no matter what. He loves us even when we didn't love him. He loved us even when we weren't interested in loving him. His love is unconditional. That means he loves us and he will keep on loving us. So look at 1 John 4, 9 and 10. We've seen this earlier. 
Uh, and John tells us, in this the love of God was manifested towards us, that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. So God gave in order that we should live through His Son, even when we didn't care about God. Verse 10 says, in this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us. So it wasn't like we were going after Him. He came after us. He loved us. And he gave his son to be the payment for our sins. So this love that God has for us, the Father's love, is an unconditional love. We need to understand that. He loves us no matter what. And our response is to that love. That's why John says in 1 John 4, 19, he says, We love him because he first loved us. And he started this love thing. Amen? Amen? We love him because he first loved us. So we are just responding to the love he extended towards us. We love him because he first loved us. Now, God's love for us, the Father's love for us, is also an uncommon love. Love that is uncommon. And I want you to just observe these two verses with me in John chapter 17. Verses 23 and 26. Jesus is praying to the Father. He says, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me. And, let's read the rest, rest of the verse together. And, have loved them as you have loved me. Let's read that part again. And have loved them as you have loved. One more time. And have loved them. As you have loved, how much does the Father love you? As much as he loves and have loved them as you have loved me. Now, you see, this doesn't compute. Because imagine a family that had two boys and one boy is perfect. He gets 100 on 100 all the subjects. He never angers the parents. He is just absolutely perfect. And then you have this other boy who's just the total opposite. If he passes in a subject, whoa, that's, that's a wonder. <laughs> and he's just totally opposite. Who do you think is going to be more loved by the parents? Logically. The, the one who's perfect. What does Jesus say? He's saying, Father, you've loved them just as much in the same manner and in the same measure as you have loved me. It takes a while for it to sink in, really. You have to really meditate on it. You have to really let it soak in that God loves us. God loves you. Let's be very personal here. God loves you in the same manner and in the same measure that he loves Jesus Christ. So let's say it. The Father loves me in the same manner and the same measure as he loves Jesus. So this is uncommon. That the same love with which the perfect one would be loved is the same love with which all the rest of us imperfect ones are loved. Just say, Like we are nowhere close to the perfect one. But in his love for us, in the Father's love for you, there is no difference. And so it's going to take a little bit of time for you and me to accept that, to come to, an, come to terms with that, that I am loved in the same way the Father loves His Son, Jesus Christ. And that gives me that same access to the Father as Jesus has with the Father. You both loved equally. Same access. That's what we call joint heirs with Jesus. But it takes a while for that to really sink in. 
And so Jesus prayed that next one in verse 26. He prayed, and I have declared to them your name and will declare it. That the love with which you love me may be in them. That the love with which you loved me may be in their hearts. For them to feel it, for them to experience it, for them to uh, recognize it. That the love with which you love me may be in them. Let them have it. Let them feel it. Let them know it. Let them experience it. So that's Jesus' prayer. That he wants you and me to know, to experience in our hearts that the, the love that God has for you, for me, is the same love with which the Father loves his Son, Jesus. Uncommon love. Or you can look at it like this. We know, uh, if we see in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and uh, so let's look at Mark 1.11 where the Father speaks of his Son, Jesus. He's saying, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well. He gets 100 and 100, all the subjects. (laughs) He does very well. This is my beloved son. I'm well pleased. It's very interesting. How about Paul writes about you and me? Look at two references. In Romans 1 verse 7. He says to all, he's writing to believers, writing to people like you and me. He says to all that who are in Rome, what's the next part? Beloved in or beloved of? So you are beloved of God. What did he say about Jesus? This is my beloved son. Now Paul is writing to the believers. He's saying, believers, you are beloved of God. So let's say that. I am beloved of God. So if you were watching very carefully to the announcements, what's the theme for December 16th? Be loved. Right, okay. right, so some connection. <laughs> Ooh, I don't want to say anything more. All right, let's move on to this message. You are beloved of God. And then he tells us in Ephesians 1 verse 6, he says, To the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he has made us accepted in the beloved. You are in the beloved, and you are accepted in the beloved. So you're now in him. So entrance has been given, you're in him. You're in the beloved. So let's say this. I am in the beloved. And I am beloved of the Father. Now, this is scriptural. This is not heresy. This is Bible. You're in the beloved. And you are a beloved of God. What did he say about Jesus? This is my beloved. What's he saying about you? You're my beloved. You are in the beloved. You're my beloved. Now, we have to accept that. You've got to tell yourself maybe a thousand times, hey, I, as much as I have messed up, as much as I feel bad about myself, whatever, 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 I am in the beloved and I am beloved of God. Let it sink in. Let it sink in. Amen? So, this is the Father's love for you. He loves you the same manner, the same measure as He loves His Son, Jesus. And so, when you approach the Father, hopefully someday we will get there, but ideally when you and I approach the Father, We have to approach him in the same way Jesus would approach him. Because you're in the beloved and you are beloved of God. 
And you're loved by the Father in the same manner, the same measure as he loves Jesus, the Son of God. So, it is not arrogant. It's not uh, us stepping out of what we are allowed to do when we approach the Father the way Jesus would approach the Father. Because you're loved in the same manner, the same measure, and you are in the beloved, and you are a beloved of the Father. So you approach Him with that confidence. The Father's love for us is love that makes us unashamed. The Bible teaches us in Proverbs 10 verse 12, but it's quoted for us in 1 Peter 4, 8, that love covers all sin. Love covers all sin. And that's the Father's love. It makes us unashamed. So think about this. You know, if you think of a parent-child relationship there, the child messes up and, all, okay, parent gives them a little spank, straighten them out. But after that, what? They embrace the child. It's okay. I mean, yes, you've messed up and we need to correct that. But that, it doesn't stop there. Ultimately, what does a parent want? The parent wants the child to know you are loved. No matter what. You may have done th things, but you are loved. And I don't want you to stay away from me. I want you to be in my embrace. Is that right? Parents can say amen. Right. It's true. Yes, we may discipline. Yes, we may correct. But it doesn't stop with that. We go beyond that. And we say, look, we want you to know you're loved. That's, in, a, in, in a much grander scale, that's how Father deals with us. His love removes all sin. Yes, we do the wrong. We commit sin. We make blunders, etc. But the Father's love removes that. He says, I want you to be unashamed before me. So as believers, really, as, as children of God, it's, it's wrong for us to live under a sense of guilt, shame, and condemnation before the Father. The Father does not want that. He wants you to be unashamed. Because His love has dealt with all the sin. Ephesians 1 and verse 4, we've read this before. It says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. You are holy. That means he sees you perfect. You are holy and without blame before him in his eyes, covered by his love. So you say, there's no sense of shame, guilt, condemnation. You are unashamed in the presence of the Father. He is your Father. You are His son or daughter. The sins have been dealt with. Be unashamed in His presence. Or Paul put, writes it again like this in Colossians 1. Verse 21 and 22 says, And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works... Yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. So let's say this. I am holy, blameless, beyond reproach, without condemnation, in his sight. That's how you, that's who you are. When God looks at you, he doesn't see you, or let me say, he sees you holy, without any blame, no reproach, no condemnation, no judgment. That's, God sees you. It's so you and I, we can be unashamed in his presence because of his love. Amen? A few more things. His love, the Father's love for us is a love that is unbreakable. Nothing can break that. Unbreakable. Strong. Nothing that life throws at you can stop his love for you. 
the Apostle Paul captured it in these words. It's really powerful. Romans 8, 35 to 37. He says, you know, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors to him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers. Nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Basically he's saying. There's nothing, no one and no thing that can separate the Father's love for you. Sometimes I think angels might even get fed up with us. It's like, Father, <laughs> that guy, I can't take care of him. Father says, my love for him will not change. <laughs> People may get fed up with us, quit praying for us. Okay, it doesn't matter. Father's love for you. Nothing can separate, nothing can stop, nothing can break the Father's love for you. So Paul basically is saying, no matter what life throws, no matter what situations, no demonic being, no angelic being, no human being can stop the Father's love for you. It's unbreakable. Unbreakable. But we have to receive that. And because of that, he says, his love makes us more than conquerors. So the Father's love is a love that makes us more than conquerors. In verse 37 of Romans 8, he says, you know, in all these things, in the midst, in, in all of these things, we become more than conquerors through him who loved us. More than conquerors. There, I just looked it up in various uh, translations. It just simply means to gain an overwhelming victory. To gain complete victory. To vanquish beyond what was necessary. To gain more than a victory. So you're more than a conqueror. Why? Because no, the Father's love for you is so strong. No matter what lashes against you, God's holding on to you. And that makes you more than a You gain victory in every situation. Just stay there. Just let his love hold on to you. And you come out more than a conqueror. You gain more than a victory. You vanquish beyond what is necessary. Because his whole love holds on to you. The grip that cannot, that nothing can break. This is because of that you and I are more than conquerors. So life may throw its worst it's worst. And in the middle of it, you can stand and say, I am more than a conqueror. Why? The worst cannot break his love for me. You cannot. So this is a love that unshackles us. It liberates us. There are two places where there is torment. One is hell, the other is a place where there is fear. The Bible says fear has torment. But if you're living in a place of fear, it's not a nice place. It's tormenting, it's disturbing, it is unsettling. It's not a place of peace or of pleasure. Fear. And so in that light, John writes this in 1 John chapter 5. I'll just read it first from the New King James and then I uh, will read it from the Amplified. The Amplified just, uh, uh, just gives us further insight. 1 John 4, 17 and 18, he says, Love has been perfected among us in this or in this manner, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Now, the Amplified. 
In this union and fellowship with him, love is completed and perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment with assurance and boldness to face him. Because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love. Dread does not exist. But perfect, complete, full-grown love drives out fear because fear involves the expectation of divine punishment so the one who is afraid of God's judgment is not perfected in love has not grown into a sufficient understanding of God's love what's he saying he's saying if you are living in fear fear that one day when you face God he's going to boot you out <laughs> if you're living in that kind of fear the fear of judgment, the fear of condemnation. If you're living now in that kind of fear, he says it means your love has not, is not perfect. It is, hasn't matured. It hasn't fully grown. It means your, your understanding of love has not come sufficient, has not grown sufficiently. But when your understanding of love, when love has been perfected in us, meaning when your understanding of the Father's love has grown sufficiently, is complete, it sets you free from fear. The fear that God will reject you, punish you, condemn you, judge you, is dispelled. Are you understanding? That's what John is saying. So if you're not afraid of that day of judgment to stand before the Father, you know that when you stand before Him, you'll stand before Him just like Jesus stood. Because as He is, so are we. So imagine if Jesus stands before the Father, would Jesus get sent out? No. So your standing before the Father is the same as Him, is what John says in verse 17. And he says, therefore, right now, we are free from that fear of being condemned, judged, uh, uh, held in that place of judgment by God. We're free from that fear. Because we have come, we have grown to a place of sufficient understanding of His love. Are you with me so far? So that's why this whole series is important. So that you and I can... Have the love of God perfected in us so that you and I can come to a place of sufficient understanding. Grow in our understanding of the love of God to the place where all fear is gone. And you stand before the Father without any sense of fear, condemnation, shame, or fear that you're going to be judged and condemned and rejected in a sight. No, all that is gone now. You've come to a place where you've grown to understand the Father's love and that love has driven out all fear. Now, you do, we have godly reverence, but we're talking about this morbid fear. He says, that's not good. If you're living in a place of fear, what John is saying is, it means you haven't come to that place of sufficient understanding. Of God's love. But when we do understand the Father's love, it unshackles us. It liberates us. You stand before the Father without any sense of guilt, shame, and condemnation as a child of God. As He is, so are we. That means, think about this. You're standing with the Father the same way Jesus would stand before the Father. As He is. So are we. As the Son is, so are we before the Father. Think about it. But how can we actually be in that place when you have a sufficient understanding of the Father's love? So, we need to come to a place of experiencing the Father's love. That brings us to this closing point here, which we want to spend some time on. We need to know, believe, receive, and rest in the Father's love for us. 
First John chapter 4, verse 16. John writes this whole epistle about the love of God. He says, and we have known. So last three Sundays, hopefully this Sunday, we are trying to help us know. We have known. Hopefully we know. To some measure, to some extent. We have known. And believed. So now we have to believe. Believe in the love. We have known and believed the love that God has for us. So we must know and believe. Believe. So all that we said is not fairy tale. It is truth. It is the word of God. And God's word is truth. Every scripture we've read is truth. So you can believe it. Just, 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 if, if, if it's in the Bible. If that's what the Bible says, I believe it. It's truth. So you have known and believed. The love. That God has for us. That God is love. So now receive that. God is love. Receive. In receiving, you don't try to earn. In other words, God is love. Just let him do what he does. Love you. Don't try to earn it. God, how much do you want me to give you? I mean, God, is there something I can give you back? I mean, how much? No. God is love. So, just receive. Just receive that. God is Why does he love me? God, why do you love me? God, I'm so unworthy. I am love. God is Why do you love me? Because he is love. God is love. That's, what, that's why he loves you. So just receive that. Don't try to earn it. Don't try to negotiate, God, how much you need. No. Just, just receive. Just let him love you. It's like what Jesus prayed. John 17, 26. And the love with which you have loved me may be in in their hearts. I want them to know, to receive, to experience the love with which you have loved me. I want them to have it. So all you do, I'll read you. Okay, Father, I receive your love. I have known. I choose to believe because this is truth. This is the word of God. I believe and I receive. God is love. Then comes abide. To abide means to dwell, to rest, to settle down, to remain, to continue. It's different from visiting, right? You visit in the morning, go. No, that isn't visit. Sorry. Abide means this is it. You're plugged in here, you're not moving, you're not moving from here. Settle down, plant it, put your roots here. We have known and believed. The love that God has for us. God is love. I've received God as love. God is love. And he who abides in love. So now we have to come to a place where we abide in love. Next Sunday we'll pick up on this. What does it mean to abide in love? But that's the place where God wants us to be. We know. We believe. We receive. But now you need to rest. Abides, settle down. This is where I am. Nothing's going to take me out of this place. Rest in His love. Abide in that love. And when we live life, we live life out of that place of abiding in love, in the love of the Father. So think about it. If you're in that place where you're actually abiding in that love, people may throw stones at you. 
You're not even interested in picking it up, throwing it back. Forget it. I'm enjoying. I'm enjoying the Father's love. I know nothing can separate me from the love that God has for me. You throw stones, you accuse, this, that. In your, in, your, in your place of work, maybe your manager gets upset with you. Your colleagues try different things with you. Uh, you know, all kinds of things, whatever happens. But you are abiding in that love. Your response is a response of somebody who's abiding in the Father's love. What will that response be? Think about it. We'll, we'll talk about it next Sunday. But that's how we are supposed to live our lives. As people who have known, who have believed, who have received, and now who are resting, who are abiding in the Father's love. You're resting. So if you're resting in the Father's love, what kind of a person would we, what kind of people would we be? Who are abiding in that love. You settle down. Where are you? Where have you settled down? Bangalore, Mumbai. <laughs> no. I have settled down in the Father's. Finished. <laughs> settled down. That's it. I'm not moving from here. Settled in the Father's love. Abide. Rest. And when you live life, you're living from that place of resting in the Father's love. I close with this verse. In Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 17. The Lord your God in your midst, the mighty one will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with so you can imagine, you know, little child, colicky, this, that, is shouting, screaming, and then mom takes it. Quiets it with her love. Peaceful. As the Bible says, he will quiet you with his love. And then stay there, stay in that place where you have been quieted by his love. Stay there. Rest in that. Abide in that. Live life out of that place of being quieted by His love. See, I'm not a psychologist, so I have learned this from other counselors. They say, you know, there are three deepest needs for every human being has. The need for security, the need for self-worth, and the need for significance. All human beings have these three needs. Security, self-worth, significance. And we look at different sources to get that. You know, as children, parents provide that to some extent. You get married, you look for it in your spouse, you look for it in your job, you do well professionally, it gives you significance, so on. So we have that need. Security, self-worth, my life means something. Uh, 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 you know, I am something. I, I'm, I'm a, I am of value, self-worth. And significance, my life has meaning and purpose. When you and I abide in the love that God has for us, these three needs, you don't have to look for it outside. It's more than met in the Father's love for you. Security. Nothing can separate you from the love that Father has. This is the highest security. No one else can guarantee this. Self-worth. Right? You are in the beloved and you are beloved. Significance. Your life has meaning, purpose. You're living for the Father's purpose. So when you are abiding in His love, these three needs are met. Don't have to look for it. I mean, thank God if your spouse gives it to you. Thank God if your job gives some of it to you. And others are okay, that's fine. Those are all extras. If it goes, it doesn't shake you. 
because you are so deeply rooted, securely grounded in the Father's love for you. Amen. So, no belief receive. That means you make it personal. Yes, Father, you love me. Every time we think God loves him, God loves her. No, God loves you. You receive it. Father, I receive what I've heard today. It is the truth. It is the word of God. I receive it. Because we read it from the Bible. We read it from the word. The Father loves you the way he loves Jesus. You are beloved and in the beloved. Nothing can separate you. Father's love. So receive. Receive the Father's love. And abide. Rest in that. Dwell in that. Live life out of abiding in the Father's love. Amen. We'll talk on abiding next Sunday. But let's remain seated please. And uh, the worship team can come up. But I want us just to just receive now. Receive. Okay. You know. Three Sundays, today is the fourth Sunday. You heard about the Father's love for you. You know, it's no shortage of knowing. But the question is will you believe this? Will you believe it? The reason you and I can believe it is because it's the Bible. It's not some man's idea, it's not some fairy tale. It's the Bible. We've read the scriptures, it is truth. So the reason you and I can believe. It's the word of God. So we have known, we have believed, but now receive that God is love. The Father is love towards you. Receive it. You tell him in your own words, in your own hearts, you pray. Father, I receive this love that you have for me. I thank you that your word is truth. I am beloved of God. I am in the beloved. Just receive that. And then rest in the love. Come to a place where you abide. God, I'm going to settle myself in this love. I'm going to let you quiet me with your love. I'm not going to let anything disturb me from knowing this and in this place where I'm loved unconditionally, immeasurably by my Father in heaven. So please, take the next few moments as between you and God to do this. Let's rise to our feet, please. I just want to pray and then we will take a few moments to sing after that. Father, we just thank you for the truth of your words. You heard your word, Father, that you love us the way you love Jesus. That we are beloved of God and we are in the beloved. Father, your word tells us that when we receive that love and love is perfected in us, it just drives out all fear, it makes us whole. So, Father God, in the name of your Son, Jesus, right now I pray for every person here and those watching us, connecting with us live or through the recorded message. Because of your great love, I pray that you will release healing, release wholeness into our minds, into our bodies. Father, I pray you will send interventions into our situations and circumstances, God. That your love will cause us to triumph. Your love will cause us to overcome. To be victorious. What things that come against us, Father. Even now, even as I'm praying, I want to encourage you just to look to God. If you are here this morning, you need healing in your body, your mind, your emotions. 
there are fears, if there are things you're struggling with, or if there are circumstances and situations that, that you need God to intervene, I want you to just pray over that as I'm praying for you, please. Let's just be a moment where we receive from God. So Father, I just pray that you will send divine interventions, Father, into the circumstances, into the situations of life where there may be difficulties, where there may be doors that need to be opened up, where there are situations that need to be changed, where God, where, they, where people need to see movement, things happening, God, where everything seems so still and, uh, and nothing happening. God, we pray in all of these this morning. God, let there be the hand of the Lord coming through. Let there be an intervention, Father God, in the circumstances of life. Heal broken relationships. Restore, God, what has been broken. Restore those relationships. And Father, I pray, even for the mind and the bodies where people need healing, God, as we're standing in your presence, that every work of the devil be broken in the name of Jesus, by the power of Jesus' name, by the anointing of the Holy Spirit, I break, I destroy the works of the devil. Satan, I come against you. I come against every spirit of infirmity. I come against every spirit of oppression, tormenting the minds, the bodies of people. I destroy your works. And I set people free in this place. I set them free. I release healing in their bodies, in their minds. In the name of Jesus, I release their healing. Release their wholeness for them. In Jesus' name, I release it for them. Release miracles in their situations to turn things around, to cause favor to come towards them in their circumstances, in their situations, for them to see their desired, out expected outcomes where God is glorified. I release that for them. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to just worship God for a few moments and then I'll come in close. talked about the Father, God being our Father. You're not sure if you're a child of God. You know, the Bible makes this wonderful statement that if anyone receives Jesus, to them he gives the power to become the children of God, even to those who believe in him. 
anyone who receives Jesus. To them, he gives them the power to become the children of God, even to those who believe in him. So what we have to do is receive Jesus into our lives. So Jesus, come into my life. I want to follow you. I believe that you died for my sins. You rose up again. I want to live for you. I want you to be my Lord. I want you to be my Savior. That's what we have to do. And anyone who does that, he makes them the children of God. God becomes our Father. So if there's anyone who's never done it before, I'm going to lead us in a simple prayer. If you've never done it before, you feel you want to do it this morning, then just pray this prayer with me to receive Jesus into your life and become a child of God. So let's take a moment to do that. We just bow our heads together. Anyone, you've never received Jesus into your life, but you want to do it this morning, would you pray this prayer with me, please? Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my life. Forgive my sins. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. And help me to follow you the rest of my life. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Anyone, you prayed the prayer with me this morning for the first time. If you don't mind, please put your hand up. Anyone who did that for the first time this morning. Anyone, just put your hand up. I see one hand up there. Wonderful. God bless you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Pray this prayer with me for the first time. Anybody else? Just raise your hand up. Our greeters will come and give you a little bag that you could take with you. Anybody else? You pray this prayer right there. Right there. Yeah, just put your hand up. Anybody else? Pray this prayer with me this morning. Okay, see another hand right up there. So we need to give him also a bag. Either God bless you. Anybody else? You pray this prayer with me. Anybody else? Just put your hand up and make sure you get the bag to you. Okay. So along with the bag, they're giving you a card that says decision card. If you just write your name and number on that and just give it back to them. Uh, somebody from the church office will call you, will tell you how to use the contents that are in the bag and guide you uh, with your next steps. Uh, in your spiritual journey. So thank you so much. Let's close this morning. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit continue with each of us always. In Jesus' name. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at abcwo.org. Also visit our website abcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.